Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to sit just because it's a small room and I'm really tall, so I just, <laughs> it feels like I'm overwhelming people sometimes when, this, when I'm in this in kind of environment. Can you all see okay? All right. I'll just go. No, you might okay. have to just move back just right. a little bit. So there, there we go. Really there we go. Thank you. All right. So that uh, triggered the, the first slide. So we as marketers, so I work for IBM Marketing Cloud, and IBM, if, in case you hadn't been aware, um, we're now calling it Watson Marketing uh, as of this week. So it was just changed. We change our names of our products about every year. So it's time for us to change the name again. Um, and so the reason we changed it to Watson, Watson is our cognitive brain. So it's the, we believe it'll be the first computer that reaches full cognition. It'll become essentially a human. Uh, and the good thing with Watson is that we can ask it incredibly complex questions in it gives us really interesting feedback. So we'll talk a little bit about that, but we'll also talk about the other components of the marketing cloud in theory. This is not a pitch. Uh, don't want to sell anybody on it. It's just these are concepts and we'll use some of the, the, the products because there's plenty of others out there. So when I say things like email uh, in your mind, replace that with email, SMS, and push. I've been doing email for 14 years, so it still comes naturally for me just to say email. But when I say that, it's really email, SMS, and push. So the first thing is, uh, it's the best of times, it's the worst of times to be a marketer. So when I started off, yes? Sorry, uh, what's push? Uh, push. Yes, and what, before then, thank you very much. Yeah, we'll actually go through push and SMS. It's actually, if you're not familiar with it, there's a more complex uh, explanation I'll give for it. But that's, yeah, it's, um, it's when your app goes and pops up gotcha. with a notification. Okay. And uh, SMS is when you get a text. Uh, generally from a family member or from a friend, but also increasingly from some companies, depending on what region you live in. Uh, so when we talk about marketing, I started off as a marketer. Uh, and back in the good old days, 1999, in San Francisco, you could spend a couple hundred thousand dollars on a party, have a couple of bands, a couple of caterers, caricaturists. We had a psychic for some reason. Uh, and not once in the in following year did somebody ask me what the ROI of the party was. It was fantastic. <laughs> so the reality is, is there's still people out there who treat their marketing budget as a party budget. Uh, but increasingly, that's no longer the case. Increasingly, we can assign a value to every dollar spent. And we do that through the use of data. Now here, this lovely little eye chart, and there'll be another version of this coming up, is uh, Chief, Met, uh, Chief Martech has been doing this for a few years now. And this is every company in the world that will help you with different subsets of basically looking at data. And it's a massive data set, but most of these companies are small little providers that can do one or two little things. And if you look really closely, you'll see things like Salesforce and IBM and Adobe's big A logo and, and some other recognizable things. But by and large, most of these are pretty small companies. They're sub 100 million in sales. Once they hit 100 million in sales, they tend to get bought by IBM, Adobe, Salesforce, or Oracle, uh, which is the case for the company I work for, which was Silverpop, which was an email marketing company. So when we look at some of these, um, this, this role of data and how this world has changed from marketing as a party engine, uh, a lot of that has to do with chief marketing officers or chief marketing technology officers or some flavor of this that's really started to permeate the industry. I remember when I, I first met a CMO, I thought it was just some jumped up SVP of marketing. But, but the reality is the guy really understood the technology. And a lot of what's happening today in technology spend is actually coming out of marketing. A friend of mine is a CIO for a company, or she was a CIO for a Gap, and she left, did a couple other things, and she was going to find a new role, and I asked, well, why don't you just do a CIO role? And her response was, yeah, the only thing you get to buy is cash registers, and that's boring. I want to go buy the analytics software. I want to buy the stuff that's tied into the CRM tools. I want to do the optimization tools, but that's all being handled by marketing today. And so as a result, we've seen this real shift in how companies are run. The ones that, the companies that do the best, the chief marketing officer, or whoever's in charge of marketing, is also in charge of sales because there's a real overlap between those two departments. And when you assign a number to a marketing department, you start a sales number, you start seeing performance because obviously compensation drives performance, right? 
So then they start really understanding, okay, we're spending all this money, how are we gonna utilize this? Um, and in this case, we have 62% of CMOs are feeling pressure from their CEO or board. My question is, what about the rest of them? What about the 38% who don't, didn't respond to this and didn't say that they, they feel pressure? To them, I say, hold on to your job until you retire because, man, this is not going to go well for you. Um, and then 65% of them say the pressure is increasing. Obviously, that number should be 100 as well. So how does, how does data fit into this and why does data matter? So who's this? You guys know this. Boris. Good old Boris. This is the moment that Boris Yeltsin realized that communism was a scam, that he had been lied to his whole life. And what happened is, it's actually a fairly funny story. Boris Yeltsin was just as ascended to be a member of the Politburo. This was the big leagues. He was really excited. He gets in there. First assignment, they send him to go to NASA to go see what the Americans are doing with their space program. It was a very friendly meeting. Whilst he was with his Secret Service entourage, he said, I'm curious about American supermarkets because we, we've been told that in America, your children are starving, whereas in Russia, Though we stand in lines for bread, we have bread. And they said, oh, well, if you like, we'll go to a supermarket. And later in retelling in his biography, um, the Secret Service literally drove up to a Randall's, which is where truck drivers and waitresses go to go grocery shopping. And they secured the perimeter, which means they locked everyone inside, <laughs> frisked them, brought in Yeltsin, and that was kind of it. The Secret Service didn't really think about it. It wasn't a big plan. It wasn't a big propaganda play. Uh, Yeltsin thought it was a propaganda play because he walked in and he's standing in front of a bunch of frozen popsicles. And years later, he would say to his biographer, even the chairman of the Politburo cannot buy frozen waffles. And here in America, they have four types of frozen waffles. He then went and asked the manager of the store what kind of specialized training he had. And when he found out that the guy had a high school education, he was shocked. And then when he went and talked to the pharmacist, he said, do you have access to penicillin? And the pharmacist said, what type do you want? And Boris Yeltsin said, what do you mean? Boris Yeltsin didn't know there was more than one type of penicillin. And when he went back to his hotel room that night, he cried. And the reason he cried is his mother died because she didn't have access to penicillin. And here he was in a store in America, some average Joe store, and they had boxes of penicillin for different types of diseases just sitting there. So why am I telling you this story? Boris Yeltsin's entire worldview was changed by a new set of data. He did not have access to the data prior, but once he had that information, to the, that, information that new data set, he essentially went in and overthrew the Soviet Union. He was part of the reason why the Soviet Union ultimately did fall. He was one of the people working inside to crush what he saw as a corrupt system. And the only reason he did that, it wasn't he wanted to become chairman, it wasn't that he wanted uh, to change the world, it was he was pissed that he had been lied to and suddenly he had access to new information. So when we talk about data and the data flow back and forth, one of the biggest problems for years, and I've been pitching this basic premise for years, that we have all of our data coming in together and that once it's in together, we can really start to understand it. And once we understand it, we can have insights. And once we have insights, we can make massive decisions. In Boris Yeltsin's case, of course, overthrowing the government. In your case, maybe it's changing how you do marketing, right? Uh, but the biggest problem that we have had over these years is people come in and say, well, that's really great, Pear, but how am I supposed to move my data from 17 different systems, integrate them together, and make it a cohesive whole? And the response is generally, look, over there, there's a bird. <laughs> Let's talk about something else. <laughs> Misdirection, right? Um, and for years, we did that. And for years, we go back to marketing, and we go back to uh, the engineering team and say, guys, you've got to figure this out. Like, this, is, this shouldn't be this complicated. And it turned out it was wildly complicated. Um, and when IBM bought Silverpop, the second or third meeting, they sat down with the engineers and they said, what do you guys want to do? And they said, well, you know, we want to improve this. No, no, no. What do you want to do that's new? Like, what is the thing when you guys have three or four beers in you that you guys all say that you should totally be doing this? And 
one of my friends was in the meeting and said, you could tell the entire room got super uncomfortable because it's one thing to mouth off like, oh, dude, we should totally be doing this. This would be awesome. And then now someone's saying, well, we'll write you a blank check and you can go do that. The number one thing was they wanted to be able to create a system in which you could take data from one data set to another in a simplified manner. And what they, the, IBM uh, designated 56 new uh, engineers to, to build this tool. This is actually a free tool. You can download it, you can play with it. It's called UBX, Universal Business Exchange. It's not gonna be free forever, but for the time being, it's a freemium model. So you can go in, you can set it up. And what we did is we worked with Salesforce, Oracle, you name it. And we tied in the APIs required to push and pull data out of their systems and into another system so that you can move your information back and forth in a simplified manner. And once you need to get a layer down, there's of course other ways you can do it that's a little bit more complex, but just from a simplified manner, you can now push and pull that data. So when I say move all your data and your immediate response is, oh, that's really a pain in the ass. Well, not anymore. Now there's actually a tool, it's free. Go play with it, see if it works for you guys. So when I, talking about evolution and revolution, it's not necessarily coming in and doing something really radical, right? A lot of this is just get better at what you're doing. Start incorporating some of this information. Be able to work within this from a step-by-step -step basis. So don't try and you know, swallow the whole elephant. You're gonna to have to start at the tail and work your way to the tusk. Uh, and part of that is gonna be first understanding a couple things. One, data. If you don't know your data, if you don't have a good analytics tool, the rest of what I'm gonna say is gonna kind of be a waste. Because a good data tool, you're going to have to understand who are the individuals that are coming into your system, who are coming into your web properties, your mobile properties, your stores, if you have stores, who's coming into your call centers, where are they coming from, and what else have they touched. And once you understand all of this stuff, you can start to utilize that data and really start to massage and, and create personas. And from personas, you can create marketing chains and so forth. So here is... Here's our, our good uh, Chief Martech slide again. And this is really how this industry has grown. In 2011, there was 150 companies that were being tracked. Today, at the end of the year, we're looking at 4,000. So you have this massive explosion because there's so many people who have good ideas. I live in San Francisco. Uh, about once a month, somebody comes up to me and says, Pear, I've got a great $10 million idea. And a $10 million idea is enough to get enough staff that you don't actually have to do a whole lot except focus on building out the tool and selling it. And then you hit $100 million and somebody buys you and you cash out. That's the goal today. It's no longer going IPO. It's having somebody big buy you, right? And so a lot of these companies are in that process. They're just trying to figure out how can I do one cool little thing and make that work. Now the problem with that strategy is that it now has to integrate with all of your other stack. So all the other tools that you have. You have email tools, you have analytics tools, you have push tools, you have web content creation tools, you have all this stuff, and all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle have to at some point fit together, right? At IBM, we refer to our, our technology stack as the Frankenstein monster, as we just bolt stuff onto it like crazy. Like, oh, well, we need a new analytics tool or we'll buy a new one and we're gonna put this on top of this and we need a, a new payment processing system, we'll just shove that in there. And so we're, as a company, just as guilty of this as everybody else that's out there. Uh, Delta, about two or three months ago, I don't know if you heard this, Delta's entire system crashed. I was trying to fly that week, <laughs> that day actually. And what happened was two things. One, their primary and secondary server farms were in the same electrical grid. So when the grid went down, both of their servers went out. It's a stupid jackass move. Like whoever made that decision, I hope was not only fi fired, but vilified in the community because it was done. Uh, there was both in Atlanta and um, Delta is a very Atlanta focused city. The second thing is they had a piece of software that may or may not have been designed by my employer uh, in 1963. So put it that in context, I was born in 67. <laughs> so when it was four years old when I was born, <laughs> and this is a pivotal piece of their software that routes seats in airlines. It was written on punch cards. Delta still uses it, 
And the reason that we've been told year after year, because we keep going after that business to replace that software because everybody knows it's a huge liability, is it's too integral to everything else that we do. That outage cost them, uh, their initial estimate is $100 million. It's probably going to come in about three to $400 million. Uh, so they are finding budget, surprisingly, to fix this piece of software. It took seven hours for the piece of software to come back online. Um, and so what does that mean for us and for our customers? Well, as a Delta user, and that week I was trying to fly to Sao Paulo, uh, Brazil, I flew the same number of days as I would have flown to Sao Paulo, spoken, and flown home, just flying around the United States, trying to get down to Brazil, but kept missing flights because the, the entire system was a nightmare. As a consumer, I was incredibly frustrated. And I'm a Diamond member with, with Delta. So I had a special 800 number. That number, I normally call it, there is a 30 second wait at most. There was a 30 minute wait on that line. So their entire system was just completely overwhelmed. What they had also failed to realize, to a certain extent, what they've actually done a really good job on another extent, is that their customers are using all sorts of different devices. So I'm gonna guess nobody in this room does not have a Facebook account. Does everybody? Have a Facebook account, right? Okay. Uh, does anybody in here only use their Facebook account on one device? Yeah, we use whatever's handy, right? You reach in your pocket, one of several devices are there. You go on your wrist. Go the, uh, see, having now used this, I can write this off on my taxes. So my yeah. Wrist, but I, yeah, I yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, now I can write it off on my taxes, though, because I mentioned it in a speech. So that's. <laughs> <laughs> So the oh, sole reason I mentioned it. Uh, but we, we now have to design all of our systems to work on all these different platforms. And when you start thinking about this as a workspace, this is a very small workspace, right? So you have to make everything really small. Uh, we actually at IBM did a project with Bank of America where we won an award for it, but it was an app that included the iWatch six months prior to the iWatch coming out. The only thing we knew was the resolution of the screen and the size of the screen and some base information about the programming language. And so we developed this entire app with this, with this concept in mind that we still have, as developers, have to think about is, why are we creating an app? How are our customers gonna use it? How is this different from our website? How is this different from kiosks in our store if we have re retailers? How is this different from everything else that our customers are touching? So that everything that our customers touch has a consistent feel about it, right? So if we have a consistent feel, we know that we're going to be able to, we're going to be able to allow our customers to feel comfortable with what's going on. With the situation with Delta, I was very uncomfortable with that entire experience. And that was simply because they didn't have sufficient load to be able to handle what happened that day. But it was an extraordinary event. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about lead scoring. Lead scoring has been around for a long time. It's an idea that a lot of us are uh, used to. It's predominantly been a B2B solution, but we're migrating more to a B2C environment. And what lead scoring does is it allows us to go in and look at our lead flow and decide what is for real and what is not for real. So as a rule, as I say, I've been doing this for 14 years. As a rule, I can guarantee that everyone in this room's email list 70% of your list is crap. Because what happens is, is we all gather, 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 but almost nobody has a way to kill off. We don't think about the fact that we create, but we also have to destroy. And the reason we don't, in many cases, if you've been doing email marketing for a while, um, marketing managers used to get comped on the number of new emails that they got into the system which drove behavior. As a result, everyone would do these wacky things to get 100 names. Um, if you've seen on your Facebook profiles, th this is actually still going on, um, name a city that doesn't have Q in it. You know, these, these sort of things, they, they get spread around like crazy. The people who are doing that, they're actually signing a permissions thing that they don't realize and then signing up for the newsletters and they're driving numbers for radio stations in Oklahoma. Now, chances are that nobody in this room is going to ever listen to a radio station in Oklahoma, even if you're in Oklahoma. So, all awful. Uh, but the, 
But if you're a, a marketing manager in Oklahoma and you're not terribly sophisticated and your agency comes in and says, I can get you 100,000 people who are going to like your station, you're going to think, wow, my boss is really going to be impressed with that. So I'm going to do that. So this is how we actually start looking at what's coming into the pipe and how important it is. And for this to work, it's pivotal that the little blue up here, 1A, 1 to, or A, B, A2 and, and B1, that we understand who is our customer. And this is normally how I start a lot of conversations when we start doing consulting gigs, um, is who's your customer? And what I often hear is, everybody's our customer, or all these, these sort of people. What I want to hear is, 17% of my customer base last year was 18 to 35 year old females with four years of college education and a pension for yellow cars. And if you can say that and you know those numbers and you can say, well, 14% are, are males that fit this criteria and 12% are this, then you now understand the personas who are actually buying from you. And to be able to know that information, you have to know your data, which means you have to have good analytics. Google Analytics is not going to work. You have to be able to identify where people are coming on your website, who they are, and how often they're touching you. And what is the end goal that they actually come in and buy? So basic analytics don't really work here. Good analytics is required here. Second, you have to be, ha have the software to be able to track this. And it's actually not that sophisticated anymore. It used to be really tough. Uh, we, ha we have a new product coming online that's also going to be a freemium model uh, that actually creates some of these personas for you by looking at your data. It's with one of our partners. Uh, those sort of things are really cool. Question? Throw a curveball in here, being, you know, knowing my background. Um, is that fine that you've got all that, but the, the, the biggest challenge anybody has got is all those people in the sales team, all the people at the service desk, all the people on the telephone taking them down, doing populating those fields so you can do the analytics. And or the, inf the, the most of this should be actually being done automatically. This should not be being done by the sales team mm -hmm. on the first level. People come to you initially via your website. They don't call first. They have to find your phone number. So you should be tracking people prior to call. And once they call, then you have to have structure within your call systems behind you um, to be able to have uh, individuals be able to properly input data. So you're correct. If you have junk in, you have junk out. I've been working in junk for years. So right. Just having the right CRM or the right um, framework doesn't mean to say no, you have to work have, off it. You've got right. to have people and discipline. Right, you have, and discipline is the key thing. Uh, the way we did it with our systems is we would audit our systems periodically and fire somebody very publicly. You want to call the herd? <laughs> get it right from the beginning is a good idea. <laughs> yeah, you want to call the herd, that's the best way to do it. Very publicly, very big, you don't have a lot of problems for about six months and you do it again. It's sort of your lowest performance. Um, sorry, I manage people, that's how I do it. Um, yeah? This sounds pretty sophisticated. I'm wondering if, if this sort of thing is accessible to smaller businesses? It is. There are several tools, aside from ours, obviously. Uh, Marketo would be one of them uh, that comes Marketo. in. Yeah, Marketo comes in with some of these capabilities. Um, yes, it is. Uh, and it depends on this, the unit sales for your, what you're selling. I mean, it really develops on that. Uh, I had a guy years ago who taught me a very good lesson. Uh, I basically blew him off. He sa I said, how many names do you have in your database? He's like, oh, I got 700 names. I was like, well, I'm late for lunch, sir. And I really would rather go have lunch than talk to you. And said it much nicer than that. But I said, well, you know, we start $1,000 per month. That may be a little bit too much. He said, son, I sell jets. <laughs> I sell one jet every 15 years. I'm good with $1,000 a month. <laughs> and the point that he made in that little moment, which really resonated with me, is if your price point is a half a million dollars or a million dollars, $1,000 per month is not a lot of money. If your price point is $49 per month, 1000 bucks a month can be a lot unless you have the higher volume. So there's an equation there that has to be contracted between a cost benefit analysis and the cost of goods sold. And at the end of the day, there are cheaper ways to do this. They simply tend not to be as effective. So the question is, if you have a higher end thing, so boat, cars, houses, 
uh, real estate agents are the absolute worst. There's nobody here who's real estate. Your name is okay. Um, real estate agents are the cheapest people in the world. Whenever I've had to deal with them, they're just awful because they don't understand. They make, in where I live, they make forty to sixty thousand dollars per transaction. And for them, they're like, oh, thousand dollars a month. Like you close ten units a month. Yeah. That's a lot of money. You're making a tremendous amount of money and you're being cheap on the front end. So it's just a question of building a curve within that and somewhere in there the, the data does make sense. Some, somewhere in there, you're absolutely right, it doesn't make sense. And I'll tell customers that right off the bat. Because I'll ask them, how much is the average cost per unit that you sell? What's the, how many units do you close per month? Yeah, that doesn't make sense. But it depends on where you are in that graph. Yeah, absolutely. But to your point about salespeople, once you have salespeople, there's two flavors that salespeople make comments about marketing. One, marketing sucks, they're not getting me any leads. Two, marketing sucks, they're getting me too many leads that don't go anywhere, they're bad leads. There's never a happy medium with, with sales and marketing. I've never encountered a salesperson who's been happy with marketing. Once I brought my team on board, at Silverpop, and this is actually, this is what we used at Silverpop to sell email marketing. So when somebody came in and they were in A1, they had gone to certain web pages that we knew were important. They had downloaded certain white papers, which we knew were important. They had taken certain actions. They had maybe gone to a webinar. They had gone to one of our in-person events that we knew that was gonna resonate well with people who actually closed. So if a 1A came in, and we know that the email marketing industry has a three month window every two to three years, then that's a really aggressive person. That's somebody who we should be engaged with and we recognize that. If somebody came in with a 4D, they may or not be a human being. They may be a bot or a zombie. We were never really sure. Uh, because we could almost never get a 4D to answer the phone when you actually call them. Or if they did, they just had no idea what you were talking about. So within the middle, we have the people who are coming in who are interested, they look like a duck, they smell like a duck, but they're not quite ready to admit they're a duck. Therefore, they're not ready to buy from us. So those people in the middle would get marketing from us on an ongoing basis. But the people down in three, four, C and D, this little grid of green down there, those were our kill campaigns. We'd send five emails to some of them, three to some of them, and if they didn't open any of those, either five or three, we killed the name. Just moving on. Yeah, we'll get it to you. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not to take a yeah. No, no, no. You can <laughs> take whatever you want. Uh, but an A1 comes in, and there are certain things that we had set up to happen. One is all of my sales reps got notifications on all of the blue and the teal. The blues came in with a code rating. Well, they all came in with a code rating. But if the code rating said A1, the sales rep knew he had one hour to go into Salesforce and change the status. If he didn't, his manager, me, will get an email saying an A1 has not been responded to in one hour. I would then either call the sales rep or if I knew the sales rep was traveling or in meetings, would call the person and ask them 13 questions that I knew were good indicators of whether I felt they were for real or not and what their time frame was, whether they had budget, timeline, and need. And if I, I recognize those three factors, which for any sales to close, you have to have those three components, I would then send a text to my sales rep and say, John, when you land, call this person. Here's the answer to those 13 questions. Here's where they went on the website. And here's what the conversation I had with them. So we've already developed a rapport with them because the time between when somebody says I want information when they receive information, it's a huge effect on efficacy of close. The longer you wait, the, the more that it becomes unlikely. And then with Bs 1 and, and A2s, those ones, they could take a little while. But the final piece was if I didn't respond to the person and John didn't respond to the person, after 24 hours, my SVP of sales got an email that says, hey, neither John nor Para have followed up on this lead. That was uh, not a good conversation to have with my boss. These, are, these were people that would generally close within six months. They were 
that had an incredibly high probability of closing because we've done our research on our data. Uh, when you have these other, this first line, what the conversation changes with the sales rep, not from being all the leads are crap and why do you keep giving me crappy leads, it becomes, hey, uh, can I get a couple more of those two Bs? Let's try that. And if that, that works out well or it doesn't work out well, let's move in some of the A3s. So they were actually having a conversation about how much give. They all knew that the same number of leads were coming in every month as were gonna come in. It was just which ones were they being presented with in a more aggressive manner, right? So once we start doing that, sales changes radically. Sales reps stop wasting their time on the leads that are coming in without any qualification. We have no idea if they're good or not. And they start focusing on the things that statistically are, have a high probability of closing. The other thing that we've found, and about three or four years ago, we had a bunch of realtors, or realtors, uh, um, B to C uh, retailers who were coming to us and asking to do the same thing. And we essentially said, yeah, you got really big data sets and it's really kind of a lot of work and we don't know if we can handle it. And we tried with a couple of them, but because of Moore's law, it's actually become much easier to work with these bigger and bigger data sets. So today it's actually within uh, bigger consumers, uh, brands are starting to do this. Macy's does some flavor of this, Sears does some flavor of this. Uh, J.C. Penney is, is implementing some flavor of this in the U.S. So when you start talking about these large retailers in the U.S. and in Europe and a couple in Australia, uh, they're starting to do some flavor of this. Who's for real? Who seems to be a much better customer? And therefore, who are we going to speak to in a different manner? Is if you identify who's our gold standard customer, you speak to them differently than you do just, just your generic person who's coming along. So when we talk about this, one, of course, does this make sense? Does this make sense for your business? Does it make sense for where you are in the, in, in the um, hierarchy of things? But also communicate with your staff effectively on this. This was something that sales had a lot of input in. We sat in a lot of meetings where initially we just kept looking at each other going, why are we here? This is marketing stuff. But after about three or four meetings, it suddenly dawned on us all that oh, this is how we get our leads. <laughs> this, this is how we get better leads. And this is how we can give feedback back into the system. And then keep it alive. There is no stagnant, perfect persona. Personas change constantly. Your brands change. There was a US retailer, my wife used to like to buy their clothes, it was called BB. And BB fit her perfectly. It was in a style that she really liked. They got a new designer. And my wife referred to it as prostitute wear, but used a different word. Um, and the reality was they went a completely different way as a company. But if I was their marketing chief and all of a sudden I'm looking at my, my demographics, I'm going from 35 year old college educated women to a slightly different demographic, right? Uh, and if I don't change that, then all my numbers get thrown off, right? So it's important that we do think these through and, and don't be afraid to, to make changes and, and try different things. Um, determine which attributes are essential, weigh implicit and explicit. If you guys don't know implicit, explicit, uh, the difference is in the old days, I used to call my wife on a telephone when I was, I, I travel all over the world and I call her just to check in and I'd say, Hey, how's it going? Fine. Great. Yay, 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 yay about my day. Now I use FaceTime. Hey, how's your day? Fine. I can see your face. I know things aren't fine. The kids did something, the dog did something, the house did something, right? Something's wrong in her universe. So that is the difference between I'm telling you something and I'm telling you something. And in our web data, that information is available to us. We just have to know where to look. So when people say, for instance, on a web form, I like to run. You're a sporting goods company now. Congratulations. Uh, and I fill out a form. I like to run. Well, the reality is I'm more aspirational runner. I'm more of a sit on a sofa or do yoga kind of guy. Uh, so if you see my actions on your website and my actions don't involve running shorts, shoes, socks, tanks, but involve yoga mats, yoga shorts, and yoga towels, I've told you what I'm interested in. But if you keep sending me running stuff, then you're kind of lazy is I've told you what I'm interested in, but I also told you this other thing which turned out to be a lie. And people do that all the time. 
So we have to be able to, one, have the tools to be able to access that information if we really want to start to understand it. And then finally, uh, scoring isn't for B2B anymore. It's also consumer folks, and we're seeing a lot more of this. Okay, so mobile. We'll talk a little bit about mobile and some of the things that's going on here. Um, who here does not have a mobile device? Nobody, everyone's got a mobile. Who's, who has more than one? I have two, right, okay. Uh, I have a work one, I have a personal one, and then I've got this funny thing that I get to play with, um, which increasingly will become another mobile device. And then we have our tablets. How many of our tablets are hooked up to the internet? How many of our tablets are actually hooked up to the telephone system and we use it to do FaceTime? So it's essentially a telephone now, right? These devices are not what they were initially intended to be. If you have teenage children and you've tried to call them, they don't know how to use the call function. I called my 15 year old at the time, he's now 18, I called him up and I was trying to pick him up from a party. My wife had said, oh, it's this place and I grew up where we live and so I went to that neighborhood and I picked up the phone and I called my son. Figured this was gonna be a simple three minute engagement. Oh no, he texts. What? Pick up the phone. What do you want? I want you to pick up the phone. <laughs> you can see where this went. <laughs> it became increasingly more aggressive on my point and increasingly more frustrating on his point. And then I had this moment of clarity where I recognized that he actually doesn't want to use the phone. He doesn't want to use this communication methodology, which I feel very comfortable with, but he does not. I pay for a phone that does not get used as a phone. I pay for a device that's a texting system and an SMS system and a push system and a way to download content um, and play games. But as marketers, we have to look at these devices in another way. With, if we're in retail, iBeacons are really cool. There's some retailers doing really amazing things with them. Uh, if I'm talking about my mobile devices or my wearables, which is the new category. Uh, how are we integrating with that? Or do we offer anything for that? Is it important that we offer? Is, if I'm gonna be selling skincare, is it important that my app sh shows up on my, my, my little um, watch here? It is if I'm trying to do a stress test and I'm looking at heart rate and doing a correlation between heart rate and maybe somebody's skin care. Like I, I've discovered that people with high blood pressure have drier skin or something like that. Like that could be important, that could be really interesting or it could be a total waste of time. <laughs> so you kind of have the data and you kind of play with it. You really don't know. Uh, and then within the context of, of where we're using it, uh, are we using it on the go? Uh, how, what other information can we glean from this? Um, so part of this is also how we outbound communicate with folks. So here we're talking about SMS. So SMS is um, widely used. I think it's huge in this market. It's pretty big in New Zealand, right? That's right, okay. How much, and this is one of those things where it's really different. In the US, SMS is actually incredibly small. Uh, SMS is almost solely friends and family. There's no retailers who utilize SMS effectively because it's so incredibly difficult to get an SMS campaign going. So when we look at it as a methodology, it really is kind of a non-starter in the US. In Europe, it's actually used quite a bit in Scandinavia. Uh, and yeah. It's just because of the different ways the mobile networks are set up in the US. Yeah, so yeah. And then the UK, I don't think they actually use it much. There's a couple of people who use SMS. I think Costa Coffee was doing it for a little bit but there's not a lot. So it really depends in Asia and Japan and China, huge, SMS is huge. And part of the way is just the way it's priced out and the way that the carriers have dealt with it. Uh, so it really kind of depends on your market. I actually- It's cheap here, if anyone wants to know. <laughs> yeah. We just did some research and through four different suppliers, but really, it's really, really cost effective. Okay, yeah, so SMS is, is really a great way to communicate for a couple of reasons. One, incredibly high success rate. So you have, um, most people have it on their devices because of the high penetration of smartphones. All smartphones essentially have SMS unless you turn it off, which I only know one person in my network who did because he was getting a bunch of really weird SMS messages and he didn't know how to turn them off. 97% um, of uh, business people have it within three feet of themselves and there's a 98% uh, have an open rate. So you have these great numbers. 
The reason you have great numbers is predominantly it's not terribly much used by business. As soon as businesses start to use it, there really is a high chance that this is gonna like run off the rails. And I think a lot of marketers have been smart about SMS. SMS is really a good thing if you don't have somebody with an app, but you wanna communicate with them, say, a flight time, or that they're, land, they're gonna go rent a car. Those are the kind of things where it becomes appropriate. If Starbucks sends us an SMS every time we drive by a Starbucks because they have geolocation, it's a nightmare. Right, we're gonna, in San Francisco, I get one every 30 seconds driving down Market Street. So I'm gonna become incredibly pissed off because I'm paying for those as a consumer. Uh, so then we get into apps and apps and push communication. Push communication is my favorite new thing. And it's been around for a few years now, like five or six years. But within app, if you've got somebody to download your app and you've gone through the process of designing an app, and not everybody should, but everyone thinks they should. So the question really has to be asked, why are we creating an app and how effective is it? Um, I was at a conference uh, here in, in um, Auckland yesterday and there was a big um, department uh, um, shopping center that was trying to figure out what they should do about apps. And the only thing we could really suggest was give out free Wi-Fi and then have an app with push notifications for the stores that you're near. Like we were trying to snowball and come up with something that, but there was no real way to justify it because most apps actually get um, ignored after the first usage. So people use the average app, I think it's 16 minutes with 96% of apps not being opened after the first week of them being installed. And the reason is most apps are really awful. They don't do a lot or they do one really specific thing that we need to do at that one particular moment or we're too lazy to get rid of it out of our system. So the question is, if you have an app and if your people are using your app, where, where is it appropriate to communicate with them? Well, if you're in H&M and you want to push a, a special to them, that's an appropriate use of it. Somebody's bothered to download the app and everybody loves free money, right? If you're at a movie theater and you want to cross-sell, upsell popcorn because you know that the person walked by the concession stand, offer them a discount on popcorn or when they actually go into the app and buy the tickets, offer them popcorn with a QR code that they can present and get their popcorn and pay for it as a bundle, right? How are we using these tools to, to work with it? And this last example is actually an, an allergy company and how they're using this just to help people with severe allergies. So evaluate SMS and push, figure out if these are appropriate for you. Um, what's the mobile touch point in the customer journey? Uh, when are people using it? One of the, the funny things um, happened a couple years ago with Best Buy, which is a big U.S. white glove, you know, buy your refrigerators, buy your dishwashers, right? So Best Buy almost went out of business three years ago at Christmas. And the reason was, and they did a post-mortem and they were super honest with themselves, they had really good traffic at their stores, but they didn't sell anything. And so they went in and they looked at the computer logs on their Wi-Fi. What they found was the number one place that people went on the free Wi-Fi offered at Best Buy was Amazon. <laughs> so let me paint a picture for you. <laughs> Somebody walks in <laughs> to Best Buy is they need a refrigerator and they know everything's on sale at Christmas time. So they walk up and what do we want to do when we buy something that costs over a thousand dollars? No, we want to push the buttons. Oh, we want to, we want to see if the, oh, does this, that feels reasonable, that's good. Like we wanna, we wanna feel it, we wanna touch it, we wanna engage with it, right? Uh, it used to be we'd walk in, like our parents would walk into a store and go, right, I need a refrigerator. And the person would say, well, let me tell you about it. And they were really well trained. My wife walked into Best Buy and she asked, what's the difference between these two phones? And the guy actually reached over, grabbed a piece of paper that was sitting there and started reading to her. He had no idea is they don't train people in stores the way they do because today most people walk in, they've already done all the research, right? And it was kind of shit, shame on my wife for not doing it. But with the Best Buy thing, uh, they discovered that people were not only going in and touching and feeling the appliances, they were then price checking it with three or four different people, ordering it off of the company's Wi-Fi, which is incredibly cheeky, <laughs> and then walking up, right? Now they haven't spent a dime. So Best Buy said, wow, we're screwed. And there's a bunch of companies in America who have kind of collectively said that. Sears has said that and uh, throughout the world, there's a couple of German companies that are about to go bankrupt for the same reason. And Best Buy made a really smart decision. They said, right, in the face of adversity, what are we gonna do? 
and they said, we're going to price match. We're going to allow everyone with a blue polo, which is the uniform for the Best Buy um, sales executives. Every sales rep is going to have the ability to price match a major competitor. So if it says Bob's Appliances, no. But if it says Amazon, if it says B&H, if it says some other big brand that they had all heard of, they had the authority to match it on the floor right then and sell the unit. What happened the next Christmas? They had a record-breaking Christmas. And it made them flush again. They're actually a very solvent company where most of their competitors have gotten under because they've been stubborn about how they're dealing with the world. Social. So I don't know if you've heard this, but social marketing is really big. <laughs> Any day now, this Facebook thing, it's going to be something. Uh, <laughs> Facebook announced their earnings last night. I happened to see on the news. I think it was $7 billion this quarter, uh, $2 billion in profit. Yeah, they're doing okay. Um, so I think it's really funny that the number one and number two companies are essentially Facebook. Uh, the number one, three, the number three company is essentially a dead bird uh, because they can't even sell themselves. Um, yeah, yeah, if they're around next Christmas, I'm just, I don't know what to do with myself. But um, uh, I generally refer to Twitter as people just vomiting into the void and misquoting uh, dead presidents. But, um, and then you have Pinterest and, and LinkedIn, which are both really good platforms to utilize. And then you end up with all these that go down the way. Uh, every once in a while I'm doing one of these talks and somebody goes, oh, well, email's dead. Haven't you read? Like, oh, there's all these articles that email is dead. It's like, no, it's really not. <laughs> Numbers are still proving very successful and uh, cheapest methodology for communication that's out there and blah, 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 blah. And then I said, but what do you think is the cool new thing? And one guy actually said Meerkat. Who here has heard of Meerkat? Yeah. <laughs> the nerd in the room figured <laughs> it was Meerkat. Yeah. She and I are the only two who know and Meerkat. Periscope. Yeah, yeah. And Periscope. Yeah. And Periscope, I think they just killed because. <laughs> Yeah. That's right, we're streaming you on Facebook Live now. <laughs> <laughs> which is a good substitute. Yeah, which is, which is. But, and, and it really was just a total ripoff. So it was very funny that, uh, because they came out with Periscope and they were really excited. I actually saw them at Can Lions and they were showcasing this and I just looked at the guy and go, why do I care? <laughs> and he was like, no, it's really cool. And I'm like, why do I care? Like, uh, but the reality is, is most of the things that people are excited about are things that nobody else has heard of. Just they're excited about it because they're passionate about it. And that's really great. But the big story is still that email is still the way to go, right? So here's one of our uh, freebie customers, the uh, Atlanta um, Aquarium. So the Atlanta Aquarium has done some really smart things. One, they figured out that they have multiple customers. Because Atlanta has Coca-Cola, Delta, Home Depot, and a number of other big companies, they have a bunch of executives who all like to show how big and powerful they are. Turner TV comes from Atlanta as well. So one of the, the guy who founded Home Depot decided that Atlanta, a city with no major river nor access to the ocean, should have the biggest aquarium in the United States. Um, so he essentially pushed through this aquarium. And it's a very nice aquarium. If you get the chance to go to Atlanta, I do suggest going there. Uh, Silver Pop gets tickets every year and they have trouble giving them away because everyone at the company is sick of going. But um, they figured out that they have different demographics that they need to market to. So one, on the very high end, are these donors. People who give over $100,000, $500,000 million a year to the aquarium. They speak very differently to those people than they do to the mom demographic. And the mom demographic is interesting because they actually have an email set up so that when you first come in, they ask you some questions about how many kids you have, where do you live, what city or what suburb of Atlanta you live in, and a couple of other questions. What they're essentially really interested in is how many kids do you have and how old are the kids, and where you live. So they actually use the Weather Channel, which we've subsequently bought, but the Weather Channel micro-targets their zip code and sends them a notification if on a Friday we know it's going to be a humid or rainy weekend, that they should come down to the aquarium. Furthermore, they create this social environment to share it and encourage them to have their girlfriends come down. So the other moms come down with their kids and you have a bunch of screaming kids in the weekend at the Atlanta Aquarium and they have a bar. 
So it's really smart. <laughs> so you have a bunch of moms at the bar, you have a bunch of kids running around looking at the whale, and <laughs> that's pretty much the scene at the Atlanta Aquarium. Hugely successful by tying in these component pieces because they're playing off of a real thing. If you have children and it is hot and humid and rainy, you don't want them in the house and you can't put them outside because it's raining too hard. Um, and there's tornadoes and stuff in Atlanta. Uh, but by tying this in, this is one of the things I often have trouble with companies is that they don't think through that all of the content you create and every time you create content, you should make it as easy to share as possible because you either use it and dump it or you use it, archive and continually utilize it, which is why we're filming this today. We're creating content, we're saving it, we're utilizing it in other, in other manners. The other way is make it snackable. So imagine this Christmas you go home and they say, so what are you marketing this year? When I was a marketer, my family never understood what I actually did for a living. They just knew it was called marketing and they were really polite and they asked what I was selling and then they nod their head and that was the end of it, right? So imagine you go home this year and you say, I'm selling flour. The white substance, the white powder that's not cocaine, right? Not very sexy, not very exciting, but you're selling a lot of it. Well, King Arthur Flower is one of our customers. They actually do some really great emails. They're actually a great case study, somebody to follow. And part of the reason why they're so good is they do things like this. Cake recipes. Who doesn't want to have that piece of pie right now? Like, I'd eat that in a second. The second thing, uh, we, we have this boring company called IBM. Right, you guys have heard of. Uh, IBM has this tool called Watson, which I mentioned before. To make it interesting, Watson has created some really amazing little short videos. If you have not seen Bob Dylan talking to Watson, you really should download that and take a look at it. It's pretty funny. There's one with Carrie Fisher running a support group for in artificial intelligence machines mm -hmm. <laughs> that you have to see. That's very funny. Um, and if you're a nerd, you'll recognize most of the AI systems in it. It's, it's really good. Um, and, and then Watson speaking to authors and, and photographers and just all sorts of different people. And the reality is, is Watson as a concept is a little bit esoteric for some people, but by creating it as an accessible video, we made it much easier to kind of wrap people's brains around. When I say something like Watson helped stop the Ebola epidemic a few years ago, you're welcome by the way, um, people go, wow, that's amazing. And then I start talking about migratory patterns of people in Africa and their eyes glaze over. But we essentially had a guy come who was a professor and he had migratory patterns of trafficking in Africa where people moved around. And by taking that information, taking the hot zones, we were able to figure out where most of the people would be leaving the hot zones and what paths they would be taking. We put support people in place, mouse swab them, people with a Ebola epidemic went off to a very comfortable tent uh, where they died, and then the people who did not have it were free to go on their merry way. And by doing that, they were able to stop an epidemic with much smaller numbers than then they had initially estimated. The, the US military was actually ready to sell, send a battalion uh, to Africa to essentially take siege of a country. Uh, but by doing this, we saved tens of thousands of lives and uh, stopped an epidemic. But it's not very sexy when you talk about it, right? So we've made this a little bit easier, a little bit more snackable. Social media is gonna take about 20% of everyone's budget next year, just heads up. Uh, we were meeting with a company, I keep getting this wrong, LNP. Yes. LNP. LNP's budget is 80% for digital. Their marketing budget is 80% digital. And they took that decision this year and they have been doing phenomenally well as a result. So they stopped doing any TV in New Zealand in 2014. And they realized that that was just a waste of money for them. But they still do video. They, they still do video. That you used to see on TV. You now just but the really cool videos, and they showed it, they've got two comedians who do this thing inside of a dairy? They call it a dairy, but it looked like a store. Yeah. Yeah, okay. A dairy. A corner store. Oh, that's a like corner a store. store. Oh, is that what it is? Okay. A dairy. They called it a dairy. For me, a dairy is where a shed where you have cows. Okay. <laughs> I was very confused, but I was polite and didn't say anything. So, yeah. I'm from California. What do I know? Um, so, and then finally, lookalike modeling. And if you haven't been doing lookalike model, this is kind of the culmination of everything I've been talking about. So, first of all, who are your customers? If you can say, my average customer is 18 to 24 year old female with four years of education, blah, 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 
Penchant for yellow cars, which incidentally was something that Watson found by monitoring people, people's social feed. Uh, and we're able to then utilize that in a campaign to tighten up their social or their lookalike modeling and save them a ton of money and increase their, their close ratios. Uh, if you're able to start understanding who is my customer because you've done all this data research, because you've spent all this money and time to, to figure this out, you can then go to Facebook and say, right, I need this group of people and I'm going to hit them with this message is this is the message that resonates with these people. But if you go to Facebook and you say, hey, I heard about this lookalike modeling thing. It sounds awesome. You're going to go, great. Who's your customer? Everybody. Facebook will sell you that list. They will then hang up and laugh their ass off. So <laughs> I recommend figuring out who it is in a very tight format because that's where you're going to really succeed with lookalike modeling. And what lookalike modeling essentially is, is people who are 18 to 24 or four years of college pension for yellow cars, they have that list, we know because we help find it, uh, and they'll then put your ad in front of people that are like that who haven't heard of you, right? And it's localized, so you know that they're people who are more, more likely to be within your market. Final next steps, invite contacts to engage with you socially. The conversation's happening. If you're not part of it, this is, I'm actually kind of surprised, I, I, I still have to say this, but, there are still a lot of companies who aren't monitoring their social feeds. Uh, I had recently an, an a incident with KLM, they lost my bag. I said something on social, like, awesome, I'm six foot eight in, Ge in uh, Genoa, and I have to try and find clothing that fits me. This is fantastic. And they sent me a very nice note about how sorry they were that they had lost my bag. They had my bag the next day, but in the meantime, I had to go find some clothes, right? So it's, it's important that we do engage in social. It is important that we figure out what our customers are saying and respond to them. Every salesperson I know has had that moment where they have a pissed off customer sitting on the other side of a phone and they do this. And call them back to say, we're really sorry, or this is what happened, or this is what we're doing to fix it, or whatever, right? That conversation has to happen in social world as well. And it's important and a lot of people kind of let that slide. Uh, Arby's, the American food is basically awful, the worst sandwich you'll ever eat in your life. But um, Arby's actually has one of the best social guys out there. When Pharrell was wearing that ridiculous hat about five years ago at the Music Awards, he posted something about how it was awesome that he was wearing the Arby's hat and Pharrell liked it and reposted it it was the highest engagement Arby's had ever had online. Uh, when Jon Stewart, the comedian, quit, he had been making fun of Arby's. Uh, they offered him a job in social. That went viral. It was the second highest engagement they'd had in social. Both times the guy was sitting in his underwear on his sofa watching TV. And he just tweeted it out. So that's the world we're living in, right? Where people can take these really big chances. Um, LNP, was it LNP or Air New Zealand? I think it was Air New Zealand did a thing where they asked people to change their photos to black. Were you telling me that? With me. Uh, yeah, yeah that's right. It was their Instagram feed and they were, it was during the um, final blow to blow cup uh, and they mm -hmm. persuaded every single follower on Instagram that could to change their profile to black and then to tag all of the Qantas Instagram posts. Mm -hmm. So underneath every Qantas post was a line of black squares. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, and this was apparently something that the person thought of at 10 o'clock at night and ran by her boss and the boss was like, awesome, go for it. Right. So this is a lot of what's happening. A lot of this stuff is spur of the moment social, but it has huge impacts. The LNP people are reaching um, a, an audience that on TV would have cost them six million dollars per month. Uh, they said that they do not, in fact, have six million dollars a month <laughs> to do TV advertising. <laughs> They're a small bottling company. Um, so, and then leverage your social advertising and make it easy for people to share this content. I mean, if it's funny, people share it. Our uh, uh, thing with uh, Bob Dylan has just gone massive, millions upon millions and millions of views. And it was, it, I think, it probably took half an hour to shoot. Right. Uh, so that's all I have. Thank you very much for coming.